Some years ago, I was living in Germany, in Berlin, and while I was there, I was exposed to a lot of the electronic music that that city is quite famous for. And on the one hand, I was really fascinated by the sounds and the music that these people were creating. On the other hand, I was really bored with the live performances that they were doing of their music, which mainly consisted of someone stir um, staring very sternly into a laptop or making some minuscule adjustment of some obscure piece of desktop equipment. And so I became kind of obsessed with this idea of whether or not it would be possible to create a more physical way for people to interact with the sounds they were creating and have more expressive control over those sounds. And in so doing, actually have a better connection with the audience that they're performing to. Now, if this doesn't make any sense, don't worry, because at the time, no one, I couldn't really get anyone to understand what I was wanting to do. And so I resolved to really just start doing little experiments myself in, in prototyping. And after a lot of iterations, a lot of failed attempts and dead ends, and also, uh, bringing together an international team who could help me with it. This is kind of what we came up with. Um, it's called the motion synth. And before I really describe what it is, I am going to give you a little demonstration. So right now, the motion synth is controlling some commercially available software on this laptop. And this sound that is being played is a violin sound. And not unlike a violin, if you were just to press the strings on a fretboard rather than um, uh, using the bow at the same time, it should sort of sound something a bit like this. Um, so like with a violin, if you want to have sound, you actually need to move. And so, like a violin, you can also play in different octaves. Uh, <laughs> you, uh, you could add a vibrato to the sound. Or you could change the speed at which you slide the pitch between notes. Because we're really just generating information, not something strictly musical, you could also do something non-musical with it. And to demonstrate that, thank you for bringing that back, um, I have a little animation here. And so this animation will also respond to my emotion, hopefully. <laughs> So I'm going to try and put these things together into a little uh, quick musical performance. So, uh, the whole project was really based around the idea of augmenting people's ability to physically create information 
or also to augment their creativity. And so it, it just got nicknamed Org. And the motion synth itself consists of two components. One, you have a, a physical part, which obviously positions uh, and a mobile device, in this case, uh, an iPhone or an iPod touch. And it frees your hand from the need to um, grip the device. And this greatly increases the dexterity with which you can operate the screen. Uh, you've also got this tactile overlay which uh, provides ongoing feedback about where your fingers are uh, on the, relative to the touchscreen. And you have an app running which collects data from the motion sensors and either passes that data on to other apps or to external devices. So I guess one of the first questions you might have, considering these days that we have the technology to track human bodies with out wearing anything. You could track the hand, you could track the arm, um, totally unencumbered. So why didn't we create a, a musical interface that, um, that uh, doesn't require you to wear anything at all? And it turns out that the answer to this question is almost 100 years old now. And it comes in the form of the theremin invented in 1920 by Leon Theremin. And it's an incredibly expressive and powerful, delicate and demanding instrument to play. Uh, and it also has one very important musical limitation. And I'm going to try and demonstrate a simple sound, a kind of sound that you will never hear a theremin play. So at the moment, the uh, Org app is going to control GarageBand running on this iPod Touch. So GarageBand is going to give us a bit of a background tr track. So what's distinctive about a guitar sound is that the onset of the notes is very sudden. And when you have a, a sudden transition in time, um, the relationship of that transition to uh, a, a rhythmical structure is very salient. And so you really need that um, timing to be precise, otherwise it doesn't sound rhythmic. The easiest way to do this is, in fact, to interact with something physical that has a very clear uh, on and off moment through its um, uh, physical structure. And so the motion synth, by combining um, these, uh, this physical part and the ability to create these very uh, sudden transitions and temporally precise transitions, combining this with the ability to have gradual transitions which are created through motion. These things together are a very powerful combination. And so the last thing I want to try and address today is a question that a lot of people I think ask when they see something like the motion synth, which is, would it be easy enough for me to learn? And the answer is that, is that it is a uh, musical instrument and like any musical instrument that gives you a deep level involvement with the sound, say like a violin, you need to uh, acquire skill in order to um, uh, really uh, engage with that level of control. But the fundamental difference with something like the motion synth is that it's possible to um, give you an engaging experience from uh, your, your first initial interaction and throughout your, your path to mastery. And so I'm gonna try and sort of demonstrate this by analogy with uh, what we've got here, which is a trumpet, a very powerful uh, and expressive device. 
And probably everyone in this room has had at least 30 seconds of experience sometime with a trumpet. It usually starts with being a kid and someone at school or a friend hands you a trumpet and you're kind of excited because you've heard great music come out of it. And then you uh, start to play with the keys and uh, uh, you try blowing into it and, and the sound that you create is so horrible you never want to play a trumpet again. <laughs> and so let's imagine an alternative scenario where instead of you being handed a ordinary trumpet, you get handed a magic trumpet. And like all magical devices, uh, as soon as you lay eyes on it, you start to hear a backing track. <laughs> So you pick up this magic trumpet and you start moving it around and pressing the buttons and you, you can't make any sound. And then you suddenly notice that there's this array of switches along the side and you see the first one and it says notes. So you press notes and then you discover that by operating the keys, that you can make a sound without even needing to blow. Uh, and uh, the other strange thing is, is that you're moving around and no matter what you do, you're still just controlling the start and stop of notes. You have no other control. So whatever you do, it sort of sounds okay if a little robotic. And so you start experimenting, trying to do something musical. kind of pleased with yourself, but it's kind of, rub it's not particularly interesting, it's not very expressive, so you go back to this array of switches and you find one that's called Flutter, and suddenly you discover this new avenue of control that you have over this sound. So you start trying to incorporate this. you experiment more with this, you, uh, you, you try to incorporate it into what you're doing, but then you feel like you want more of a challenge, you want to extend your ability, so you go back to the array and you find a button called breath, and sure enough, now you actually need to do something like breathing in order to make any sound. you start trying to incorporate this into the melody that you are doing. So what's the difference between having an ordinary trumpet and a, a magic trumpet, aside from the magic? Um, the difference is, is that you had the opportunity to choose your level of responsibility uh, over controlling the sound. And by choosing a level of responsibility that was commensurate with your ability level, you could have a more engaging and musical experience that would grow with you throughout your path to mastery. So I should stop talking, because this timer is going off, but I'd like to end by saying that we really are just taking baby steps. We don't know what musicians in the future will do with something like this or what people beyond music will, will do with something like this. And I would say that if you have an idea that you're passionate about but you don't know how to start, that the best thing to do is really just to start with a little experiment and see if that experiment leads to more experiments. And if the people that you're talking to have absolutely no idea what you're talking about, that's probably a good sign. <laughs> if, you're, 
it, it could mean that you're actually onto something new. Thank you for your time. <laughs>